about what we put on the invitation and, and, and such. When you do that, though, do you notice like the language that's on um, invitations? It's like so formal. That's like, I don't normally say that, and I wouldn't describe my parents as this and this way, and how interesting that is. But then on most invitations, you will see these four letters, R-S-V-P. Rizvip, Rizvip. It's French. Respondez, s'il vous plaît, which means please respond. So it's just the French phrase, respondez, s'il vous plaît. Take the first letters, and then we just call it RSVP. And we don't necessarily think about what it originally meant, but it's the host of the event asking the potential guest for a response back to this invitation. You've been invited. Now, what we would like is if you could please respond back. We don't want radio silence. We don't want you to say nothing. We want you to say something, preferably yes, but even if it's no, we just would appreciate a response, RSVP. Jesus this morning is going to be sharing a parable, and as he shares this parable, this parable is an RS, it, RSVP. It's an invitation, and at the bottom, it does say RSVP because there is a response that is requested, and each person in this life gets to make a response. So, title this morning's message, RSVP. We'll start in verse 1, Matthew 22. Uh, agree with me in prayer. Papa, as we come before you, I thank you so much for all the folks that you've brought this morning, both first, second, first service and second service. Thank you, God, that uh, your word is true. And I thank you that as we read it, Jesus will be reading your own words as you spoke it to people. I pray that as we read your words, that we would understand what it means. I also pray that you would show us where we fit in this parable. I pray, Lord, that you would eliminate distraction in our minds and in our hearts. I pray if there's something that's been pressing on us and has been causing us to be anxious and worried, I pray, God, that you would give us your peace so that we might hear what you've said in your word. Holy Spirit, I pray you give me, understand, uh, give me uh, words that would uh, give understanding to the text. And I thank you, Lord, for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. So Matthew 22, let's read a few verses here. Matthew 22, verse 1. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Okay, so Jesus is, is sharing a parable, and he parable again is a earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so it's a story that we as human beings can understand, but it relates to something in a different realm, specifically in the kingdom of God. And Jesus, as he's speaking about this, he says the kingdom of heaven could be compared to, or it's like, and then he says something. The kingdom of heaven is not exactly the words that Jesus is saying, but for humans, it helps us to understand a little bit of what that would be like. And we see a few characters here. We see uh, a character of a king, we see a character of a son, and we see characters of servants. And then we see the invited. The king ends up having a wedding feast for his son, invitations have been sent out, and wouldn't you know it, nobody was coming. He has been speaking to the children of Israel, the Jewish people. If you've been coming for weeks here, we are working through the Gospel of Matthew, so nothing I'm about to say is news to you. But if you're newer or you're just kind of getting you up to speed here, God has been speaking to the Jewish people for a long time. He has been talking to them and telling them how much he loves them and how much he desires for them to reflect that love back to him. He, he's not going to force them to love him back because you can't force love. Love is a choice. But God says, I've made my choice. I've chosen to love you. And Israel in general has made their choice and they've chosen not to love God back. There was a prophet that God spoke through to tell Israel how much he loved them. But look at this, Isaiah 25. His name's Isaiah. Isaiah 25, verse six through eight. He talks about how he wants to have this great wedding feast here. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich foods, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all people. 
the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproaches of His people He will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. Okay, what does all that mean? Well, it's speaking of a wedding feast. We would describe it as a reception. A wedding reception is how we would say it in the modern term that's coming up. And this wedding reception is going to be so great. You know how some wedding receptions, well, guests bring presents for the, for the bride and the groom, but then sometimes they're like these like presents on the tables or whatnot. It's like, hey, you're the guest. You guys take these as you leave. Well, at this reception, this wedding feast, the guests take something that's really amazing. And it says right there, at that, he will swallow up death forever. What an amazing gift that is for the guests. Hey, death is going to be taken care of forever. Well, that's an awesome gift to to give those that attend this wedding feast. It is the wedding feast of all wedding feasts. So you look at the Bible. The Bible is not a single book. Jim, you're holding a single book. No, the Bible is not a single book. The Bible is a library of books. 66 books by 40 different authors over thousands of years. It's a library. And so this is why you can use a book in the Bible to refer to another book in the Bible. It's as if I took 66 different books off the shelves in the library from 40 different authors and compiled them into one volume. That's what the Bible is. Some people say, well, you can't use the Bible to refer to the Bible. Yes, you can. If I went to the library and I grabbed one book by an author who wrote something 400 years before this other guy and they never knew each other, I can use it to refer to it. Guess what? God just made it easy and put it all into a volume for you. And so when we look back and forth between here, there's a story that God is telling. Well, how in the world could somebody organize people over thousands of years to tell one cohesive message? Well, you'd have to be somebody outside of time who has set up people at certain points in the human timeline and that all of their stories line up and then tell this one grand story. That's what we have in the Bible. And you think about the bookends that you have in the Bible. Genesis is the first book. Revelation is the last book. I don't know if you've ever thought of the Bible this way, but Genesis, some people are like, well, Genesis is about creation, it's about this. I agree that it talks about creation. Of course it does. Right there in the beginning, you read the first two chapters, it does talk about creation. But for a 50-chapter book, Genesis is 50 chapters, it, I don't think creation is the focus of the book of Genesis because only two chapters are to it. The, most, the bulk of the book of Genesis is about families and people and what God is doing in them. But in the beginning of Genesis, after the creation was all put into place, an amazing event happens. It's the world's first wedding. And it's a wedding where the father of the bride presents the bride to the groom, which is where we get that tradition from today. In Genesis, God the father brings Eve to Adam. And so the Bible starts out with this wedding. But Before the wedding, you know how it is, like if you've ever planned a wedding or been a part of a wedding, um, you know, maybe it's caterers, got to get the the right, uh, make sure the church is set up and who's going to officiate and what colors and all this other stuff. Well, God did the exact same thing for the very first wedding. It's a wedding like no other wedding. Like, wait, what do you mean, Jim? God created the known universe for this wedding to happen. Like if you think about this, have you ever considered this, that is it possible that all of creation was created so that that wedding would take place? Everything. God's like, oh, I want the decorations to be great. Stars in the sky, sun and moon, oceans, birds, trees. I'm going to populate everything. I'm going to put a garden right there. The stage is set. The venue is ready, created from nothing. And now a man and a woman, and I'm going to walk her to him, the world's first wedding. So the Bible starts with a wedding, one end, Genesis. You know what it ends with? It ends with a wedding reception, like no wedding reception ever. The wedding reception it ends on, it's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And Revelation talks all about it. So wait, the beginning is a wedding and the end is the reception. Yeah. What happens in the middle? A lot of stuff. (laughs) But it doesn't take away from the overarching message of the Bible that you see. Well, what else does it speak about about this wedding? Let's look in Revelation on the screen. Revelation 19, verse 7, 8, and 9. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. So from the perspective of the writer in Revelation, 
seeing this event, this reception to end all receptions. For the Lamb, the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. So how amazing that is to be invited to this wedding reception. You may have been to some amazing wedding receptions, but I have to tell you, they are going to be nothing compared to this ultimate one. I mean, if God created everything to have a wedding, what is he, he's going to pull out all the stops for this reception. And it said that the bride was ready. Who's the bride? The bride are all of those that believe in and have put their faith in Jesus Christ where those that love Jesus and have given their hearts to Jesus will be united with him, the bride and the groom. Oh, and this reception, how long does it last? Uh, It doesn't tell us that there's an ending. It's the reception to end all receptions that has no ending. And you can be there because an invitation has been given for people to come to this. As Jesus is telling this parable, do you remember what it was saying there? It said that the king had a wedding feast for his son, and he sent servants out to call those who were invited. In other words, people that were already invited were reminded that they were invited. And it says in verse number three, but they would not come. Those are the children of Israel. They've rejected God's invitation to receive the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Well, maybe God didn't try hard enough. Okay, Let's talk about the servants that God has sent out over the history of Israel. He sent out prophets, prophets like, well, we were reading Isaiah, but then there's Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and many more. God has through multiple people over history told the children of Israel that he loves them and he desires for them to reflect the love back. When Jesus was um, here on this earth, he also had his disciples sharing the truth of God's word and the invitation. But Jesus sent out 72 people as well. Look at this, Luke chapter 10, verse one and two. After this, the Lord Jesus, he appointed 72 others and sent them ahead of him two by two, so they went in pairs, um, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. How sad it is that they did not come. How sad it is that when Jesus was here on the earth, by and large, the nation of Israel ignored or missed him as their Messiah. I try to think, you try to think of a modern example of what that'd be like. We don't have a king and we don't have a monarchy here in the United States, so it's kind of like royal weddings are not a thing, but let's just use a royal wedding. So like uh, Harry and Meghan, you know, and so we'll just say like their, their wedding that happened a, a little while ago. Let's say you got an invitation. I just was laughing thinking about this happening, but the queen rings you. I don't even know if she uses a phone, but she calls you, rings you. She calls you, weird. She calls you uh, and she says, listen, you are invited. I am personally inviting you to come to my grandson's wedding. And just be like, wow, you must have the wrong number. (laughs) But she says, no, it is for you. And you say, well, you know, I mean, we live in Arcata and, you know, flights are kind of limited out of here. And so I don't know if I can make it all the way to England to make it. And she says, I will charter an aircraft to fly you direct from Arcata all the way to England. I will take care of your flight. It'll just be chartered just for you. So at which point you had the invitation and now you have airfare taken care of, but then you say, well, you know, you guys, you're royals, you, you know, you kind of like to dress a certain way and I don't know all your culture and all of that. And so I don't have the right clothes. And the queen says, I will furnish your entire wardrobe. Flight, wardrobe. Okay. Well, I don't know anybody in England. So, I mean, I don't know where I'd stay. I will take care of all of your housing and accommodations. Well, I, I don't, uh, I don't have a gift. I mean, I'm going to a wedding, I should bring a gift, and I mean, I don't know what to give a royal. Like, I don't, and then the queen tells you, no gift is needed. Your presence is gift enough. And then you say, yeah, nah, nah. (laughs) That's what the nation of Israel did to God. 
God's like, I'm sorry, what, do, what, what more do you want me to do for you? What would, it, what would it take for a person to say no to such a generous offer? Is somebody so busy that the busyness of their life causes them to be blinded to an amazing event? Could it be maybe that they have an issue with the person inviting them or maybe the people getting married? In Psalm 81, verse 11, 12, and 13, God is speaking here. He says, But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me. Man, can you hear God's heart? Oh, oh, that my people would listen to me. That Israel would walk in my ways. That's the heart of, that's a broken heart there. I wish, I so wish they would just listen to me. Maybe for some of you as parents, you understand this as you've, in a sense, had these same words for your own children. Where you're just going, oh, I so wish they would have just listened and taken my advice on that rather than find themselves in a season of pain and turmoil. God, God's heart's broken over the rejection that he faces. God knows what rejection feels like and he knows how it feels like on a scale that none of us will ever understand the prophet jeremiah also sent by god wrote this about god's heart and what god says jeremiah 7 13 and now because you have done all these things declares the lord and when i spoke to you persistently you did not listen and when i called you you did not answer no rsvp responde si vous play no, no response back at all. Let's look on and see how this parable unfolds now. So the people invited didn't come. Verse four, again, he, this is the king, sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. I mean, there's steaks, they're the best ones, like everything's good to go. And the first invitation was, hey, the wedding is coming. Can we get an RSVP back? This second invitation, verse four, he's inviting the people he invited before again. He's sending servants out to just remind them, listen, I was telling you it was coming before, but now it's ready. It's here. Your presence, I long for your presence. I want you to be here I want you to be a part of what's going on. This king in this parable is responding with a lot of mercy. I think we could admit a lot of grace and a lot of patience. Verse five, look how it turns out. But they paid no attention and went off. And now we see what they did, the people that ignored him. One went to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants treated them shamefully, and killed them. This story has taken a completely dark turn. It's one thing to just say, no thank you. It's another thing to just say nothing, but to say, you know what, I'm sorry, you're giving the message? Come here, we're going to grab you and we're going to kill you, the messenger. Well, look at the things that they were doing. Verse 5, one went off to his farm. In the Greek language, as Jesus is speaking this and as the listeners are hearing, is idios agros, to his farm. Is idios agros. The word his idios is a very possessive word. And what I mean by that is it means the thing that is mine and not anyone else's. The thing that no one else has authority over. It's my area and my region and no one else deals with that. So they, verse 5, paid no attention to the king and went off, one to his own farm, his area, the thing that the king has no influence on. This is what I do, and I'm going to go back to doing what I do without any of your influence, king. The language is very strong there. It's this idea that I have things that I do that are apart from God, that have nothing to do with God, and I don't give God any permission to have any influence in this area here. And I don't have time to go to your wedding thing, King. God, I don't have any time for you because I got my own deal going on, and I'm going to go back to doing my own deal. So Jesus said, some people ignore the invitation because they go back to their own deal. Now, here's the thing. 
in a kingdom, really that that land is still the king's. The king is just graciously letting you use that land. And while you may go, I'm going back to my thing, it's not really your thing. The thing was given to you by God, and so your perception of it is wrong. What about this other person, not just the one that went back to his own farm, but another to his business? These are people who ignore the invitation of God because they're preoccupied by their daily living and they're preoccupied by their own personal interests and pursuits. It's seeing God and God's agenda as cramping your style. Like, I got stuff. I, don't, I got stuff to do. I, I know God wants me to do stuff, but I got my own business. I'm going to go take care of my own business. And if it gets too extreme, it could be even to the point where God is seen as a threat to your business. Oh man, if I start doing the things that God wants, then my business may suffer. I think you got your priorities wrong. We said this a few weeks ago, if your business, if Jesus is bad for your business, then you probably are in the wrong business. If introducing the gospel into your business and the love of Christ in, in your life, in your business would be bad for your business, you may want to think about your business again. Because Jesus is bad for some business. He was on the temple grounds. The religious leaders didn't like the fact that Jesus was being Jesus. But boy, you think about those in verse 6, the ones that seized the servants, the messengers, and treated them shamefully, abused them, and killed them. There are some people in our world they will, who will devote their entire lives to searching out information that supports their rejection of Jesus. They start at the point where they go, I don't want Jesus. And then they start to cherry pick data and then connect dots between them in such a way that it appears to support their position of justifiably rejecting Jesus. Except it's not justifiable. I would encourage you that when you are trying to find out what the truth is, Come to it knowing that you have a position on it, like this is where you start. Be honest about where you start. But then if you want to find the truth, you have to say, listen, I'm going to go look for the data and the information independent of how I feel about it. I'm just going to see what the truth is, and then I will live my life based on what the truth is. But there are folks in our world today that will go, this is what I want the truth to be and I'm just going to try to find supporting stuff that will let me justify what I do. That's not a person who actually wants to know the truth. That's a person that wants to do what they want to do with the air of an academic surrounding. See, and there were those that this invitation went out. I mean, how much more needs to happen? They end up seizing the servants because they can't handle the fact. They know what the message is. They know what the invitation is. And it's convicting them so much so that they take it out on the messenger. If you've ever been ridiculed for being a Christian, if you have tried to share the good news with somebody, and they're like, I don't need that Jesus crutch. I don't need that, that fairy tale illusion that you have. I've definitely heard these over the years. And you're just like, man, and people are just putting you down, just know that Jesus told you that, that you shouldn't be surprised when that happens. And it's not you. It's not you. It's the message that you bear. It's the fact that you hold an invitation from God. People who are at war with God will even have an issue with the person who delivers that message. I'm not going to be everybody's friend for preaching the gospel. I'm not. But I have to stick with the truth. And here's the thing, Christian, you have to to tell the truth. The world will want you to modify the gospel so that the culture can better um, receive it. Well, it's one thing to be relevant. It's another thing to compromise the truth. We are never called to compromise the truth. Well, some parts of the gospel and who God is and what he says is challenging. Yeah, yes, you're right. But it's true. And you do not have the authority to change the gospel. If you do, the one who created it will take issue with you. Don't mess with God's message. God knew what he wanted to say and God said what he wanted to say over and over again. Well, it's 2020. We got to change the gospel. If, if you change it, I'm going to tell you it's not good news anymore. It's not the gospel anymore if you change it. Well, what about those in this, in this uh, parable here that were killed today, in this day and age? There will be brothers and sisters in Christ 
who will give their lives for Jesus, who will be murdered, who will be martyred. Here's why. Because they will not deny Jesus. They won't. They won't do it. They're not going to start lying about God. They're not going to water down the gospel. They're just going to stand on what God said and stand on the truth of his word. And they will be killed. They will be martyred because they decided to stand there. Well, Jesus in this parable is saying some of those that will give the message, some will be ridiculed and some will even be killed. And it's not because of them. It's because of the power of the gospel. And it's convicting people so much that rather than hear it anymore, they'll kill the person that's delivering the message. It happened then. It happens today. How will the king handle this, that his messengers are being killed as he's trying to invite people to a wedding feast? Verse 7. Remember, Jesus is the one telling this parable. Verse 7. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Jesus is prophetically speaking here because he is in Jerusalem, And as he's speaking, where he's speaking there, the city will be destroyed in about 30 or 40 years in the future. The temple will be, the city won't, the temple will be absolutely wiped out. And to this day, from 70 AD to 2020, the Jews haven't had a temple. There are consequences to rejecting the Messiah. Verse 8, and he said to his servants, here's the king again in this parable, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. And why weren't they worthy? Because they rejected the invitation. They just rejected the invitation. Look at this. In Genesis chapter 6, Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His day shall be 120 years. So this passage in Genesis there, this is not God saying that human beings are going to live an average of 120 years. That's not what this is saying here. Some versions of the Bible will say this, God's spirit will not contend with man forever. God's not going to wrestle with people forever. He'll wrestle with people for a while. He'll allow people to reject him and to fight him on certain things. But at some point, that's going to end. When this was said in Genesis 6, if you get to the end of this chapter in Genesis 6, it talks about a man. His name is Noah. And 120 years after Noah started building the ark, the flood came. Jesus, uh, God is saying here, I'm not going to fight with people forever. I will be super gracious and extremely patient. And I think we can all agree 120 years is a very patient God. He's saying, and he gave them a timer. He said, your days will be 120 years. If you want to keep fighting me, then you only have 120 years left. Because at the end of the 120 years, the ark will be done and the rains will come. And judgment will come upon all of those that have been rejecting me. No one can blame God for being super patient there. Now, Jesus is telling people that it's coming again. That to a Christ-rejecting world, God is going to come back. Jesus will return a second time. The thing is, the second time, he doesn't give us a date. He could come back today. He could come back tomorrow. Is God allowing this world to fight him on things and is this wrestling and contending happening? It is happening right now, but we must not play God to be a fool. Because anybody that played God to be a fool back then, they're dead. And anybody that plays God to be a fool now, um, the same God that did that then, he's been gracious and warned people. He's gracious and warning people today. But there will come an end. This is why we have to have such a heart for those who don't know Jesus. Because for them, there is a day coming And our prayer is that God would use us to share the love of Christ with them and that they would choose to respond to God's invitation. But that choice is up to them. Verse number nine, because this parable is not done yet. What's going to happen now? There's nobody coming to this wedding. Verse nine, go therefore to the main roads, the highways, the main byways, and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. This is a crazy, okay, that is a crazy invitation. What if I, for my wedding, uh, for for Don and I, for our wedding, we said uh, on the invitation, it said, listen, everybody in our town is invited. Everybody. You got nothing to wear? Uh, That's, you know, for the wedding? No problem. We'll provide wedding attire for you. 
Uh, the food, all covered for for you. Oh, you don't have a way to get to the wedding? We'll provide transportation for everybody. That's a, that would be an outrageous um, invitation for just a small town like that. But could you imagine this? That this king is saying, just go get everybody and have them come. Well, who would be invited then? Are, are bad people invited? Yes, bad people are invited. Are good people invited? Yes, good people. We'll talk about bad and good in just a moment here. What about Jewish people? Are they still invited? Yes, they are still invited. Okay. What about Gentiles, non-Jews? Oh yeah, they're invited. How about poor people? Can they come? Oh yeah, they're invited. Rich? Oh, they're invited too. Slaves? Slaves are definitely invited. What about free people? They're invited. What about moral people? They're invited. Immoral? They're invited. Religious people? Yeah, they're invited. Irreligious people? They're invited as well. This is an outrageous invitation. Outrageous. Everybody? Like, every, you're not even going to put a little filter on that? Like, just a small filter? How about, like, the super crazy people? Everybody. Of which are some of us. No, so, uh, <laughs> Matthew 9, 13. Look at this. Look what Jesus said here. Go and learn what this means. Jesus is like, go do some homework. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. That's all he has to work with. I was like, I didn't come to call people who are right before God. I've come to call sinners, those who are separated from God, to be right with him. And then Jesus said in Luke 19, verse 10, this message is going to have so many cross-references, so you can just write down references here. Luke 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Jesus is like, that's my mission. I'm here to come and seek and save those that are lost. Well, Jim, we've got to talk about these messed up people, though. Like, seriously, there has to be some limit on what God is going... Like, he must not give some invitations out to some people because he just knows, right? For God so loved the people he knew that would receive him. For God so loved the world. Open invitation. Even to people that he knows are going to reject him, even to people that he knows are going to reject him, he gives the invitation to everyone. But there's some people that are, uh, uh, okay, look at a list here. Here's some, here's some of the people that would be invited. 1 Corinthians 6 uh, on the screen, 9 through 11. Paul is describing um, <laughs> the kind of people that the church is made up of. You should probably see yourself on this list someplace on here. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, men who practice homosexuality, thieves, greedy, drunkards, revilers, swindlers. You got, you're on that list someplace. Someplace on this list, you're on there. But here's the thing. People, when they quote this verse, sometimes they just quote these two verses and they stop. And I'm like, no, 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 read the next verse. Because this is the list of like um, some seedy characters, right? Look at the next verse here. And such were some of you. He's talking to Christians and going, and such were some of you. You look on that list and you go, oh no, I'm definitely on that list for sure. I look at that list and go, yep, I'm on there. And so was I. So was I. Until Jesus entered my life. Because then I'm not a slave to sin anymore. Now I'm controlled by God. I don't have to fulfill the lust of my flesh because I can now fulfill the will of God. When you're a Christian, you are finally free. Free to do what I want? No, not free to do what you want free to do what God wants. For the very first time in your life, you're free to do what God wants. Finally, you have freedom over yourself. You don't have to do everything that you desire to do for yourself. You can actually think about something beyond yourself, and you can think about what God would want for you. Yes, the one who even created you. Verse 11 says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, sanctified, and were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Christians are a seedy bunch of people. <laughs> oh, no, but I see them, and they seem somewhat okay. Yeah, yeah, you wait till you talk. Ask them what their story was before they came to know Jesus. You just be like, you did what? You were what? <clears throat> Here's the thing. That's all God has to work with. If the invitation didn't go out to everyone, and it only went out to good people, and this room represented that, there would be nobody in this room. Yeah, you may think, well, compared to this other person, I'm good, but that's not the standard God uses. God uses the standard of perfect. How are you doing with that? That's the standard. 
That's why nobody would be in this room if it was based on our merit, because none of us are perfect. That would almost require someone who's perfect to take our place. His name is Jesus. God so longs for everybody to be at this wedding feast. Again, this reception to end all receptions. Revelation 22, last book of the Bible, Revelation 22, verse 17. There's a lot of people inviting here. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the bride. Those who have received Jesus Christ. What do they say? They say, come. Come to the wedding feast. And let the one who hears, so if you hear that invitation to come, what are you supposed to do? Let the one who hears say, come. So if you've been invited, then guess what? Your responsibility is to invite other people. Oh no, I got invited. It's a private thing. I'm not telling anybody else about this awesome wedding reception. No, if you've been invited to come to it, you need to tell other people about it. And it says, and let the one who is thirsty come. You know, the things of this life are not satisfying for you. It's like salt water. You just keep getting thirstier. You took a drink, you're like, it's wet. Therefore, it's, "Mm, I'm still thirsty. Maybe I need more of it. And some people just keep drinking more and more as if more and more salt water is going to satisfy your thirst. The invitation is here. If you're thirsty, come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life do it without price. Wait, it's not going to cost me anything? No, somebody already paid for you. It's all covered. But you have to respond to the invitation. That part's up to you. This is a picture of salvation that's based on grace. It's not merit. It's not on what you and I do. It's based on favor that's been given to us, not because of anything we've done. Hundreds of years before Jesus, God spoke through the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 55, 1. Invitation. There's RSVPs throughout the Bible. There's invitations throughout the Bible. Look at this one from Isaiah. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, I can't purchase it. Come, (laughs) buy and eat. How am I going to buy and eat? Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Just come. Come and enjoy yourself and come until you're full and be satisfied. So in this parable, Jesus is still not done yet. And I want to show you this picture. This is a picture of where Jesus is sharing this parable in. And this is so important. Look at this picture of the temple. The temple was, got more and more exclusive as you got further, as you got closer to the back of that building, the tallest building up there. So you had the holy place, and then in the back of that building, you had the holy of holies. It was such an exclusive spot that only one person could go into that room one day out of the year, the high priest. And then as you came out of that, only the priest could be there. And as you came out of that, only the men could be there. And as you came to this area that was yellow, men and women could be there. And as you came outside of this, you could have non-Jewish people there. Jesus is there in the court of the women where men and women could be. He's speaking to religious leaders and he's talking to them in this parable. And parables will reveal the truth to people whose hearts are open to God. And it will absolutely blind people whose hearts are not open to God. They'll just be like, oh, cool story, dude and miss the entire point of what's being said. Jesus is speaking this parable and saying, the nation of Israel has rejected me, so the gospel is going to go out to the whole world, as was originally planned. But where is he saying this? He's saying it in a very exclusive spot right now. I wonder how many of the listeners whose hearts were open to God were like, this is going out to everybody. It's going out to the people right outside that wall over there? Yeah. What about outside the temple uh, to the city of Jerusalem? Yeah. What about to those uh, Samaritans. We don't even like the Samaritans. Oh, it's going to them. It's going out. The gospel and the invitation is for everyone. Verse number 11. So the, uh, the wedding hall is packed now, right? Verse 11 of a whole mix of people. <laughs> and, uh, but when the king came to look at the guests, he saw that there was a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, the king said to this guy who was dressed inappropriately for this wedding, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he, that's the guy, was speechless. Uh, what's go- I don't understand. What's going on right there? If you weren't able to provide yourself a wedding garment, they would provide these linens and these robes that you could wear. So because this person was there at this wedding feast, the listener to this parable would have understood. They all would have been like, why is that dude not wearing the right thing? Because they know that he's been given the right garment. He's just chosen not to put it on. And the king looks at him and goes, where is your garment? And it's not like the guy's like, oh, I forgot, or oh, I, I, I didn't. He was speechless because the man was busted. He knew exactly what he had done. 
he didn't want to wear the wedding garment. He didn't want to put on what was given to him. How, how did these other guests not see that this guy didn't wear what he was wearing? Because I don't think the thing that he was wearing was a physical thing. This is a parable. Keep that in mind as well. I think the thing that God is looking for, for a person, and no one at this wedding feast is going to be without this, at this uh, final marriage supper of the Lamb, it's this robe or this cloak. What kind of special cloak is it? It's a cloak of righteousness. The Bible speaks about this over and over again, that God will give you a robe of righteousness. It makes you righteous. And again, don't think about physical clothing. This is something that God gives you that makes you, for the first time in your life, right before God. But you can't get the robe of righteousness unless you receive it through Jesus. And if you think I'm making this stuff up, that's okay. You should question what I say, but then you got to do your homework. Isaiah 61 verse 10. I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God, for he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation and draped me in a robe of righteousness. I am like a bridegroom dressed for his wedding day or a bride with her jewels. In other words, I am ready for this event. I am wearing the right clothes. God has given me the cloak of salvation and the robe of righteousness. Jesus speaks about it hundreds of years later in Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, the scribes and Pharisees were the ones that people thought were the most righteous, but Jesus is like, that's just surface righteousness. That's not real righteousness. They're good. They got the wrong clothes on. Well, with my human eyes, they have the right priestly clothes on. Mm -mm. I, with my God eyes, see that they don't have the actual robe of righteousness. And Jesus says, you need to have righteousness that's greater than these fakers. God's not looking for people to play church. He's looking for people to follow him, Christians. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, after you become a Christian, look at this, and put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. When you're righteous, when God gives you his righteousness and you're righteous before the Lord, you, it's, sometimes people think like, well, I've become a Christian, now I've got to like give up all these things. Here's the thing. You become a Christian, your heart changes, and the things that used to pull you from this world don't have as strong of a pull on you anymore. That's the beauty of it, is your heart changes. See, before you're a Christian, you're like, my heart is towards all these things. Right, you need a heart change. Because you're not able to do it with, unless your desires change, and God changes your desires. All of a sudden, the thing that you thought was so important you're like, it is the most important thing in my life. I mean, look, it's higher than anything else in my life, and that's what I aim for. That's my goal in life. And then you meet Jesus, and then you receive Jesus, and as you look at Jesus, you then look over at the thing you were comparing it to, and you go, where is that thing? It doesn't even compare to him. Jesus is my new standard. And then you realize that there's nothing in this life that's greater than Jesus. And so then your heart and your affections are towards the greatest thing in your life, which is Jesus. And all the other things in this world don't have as strong of a pull on you as they used to. And you're no longer a slave to them. But the only way to do that is to have your heart changed. And the only way to have that happen is to ask Jesus to change your heart, to respond to the invitation. You can't do it in your own strength. You can't change your own heart. I mean, the king willingly and freely is going to give the appropriate clothing, but you willfully have to choose to put it on. Let's look at these next two verses, <clears throat> and I am going to tell you that these are intense verse, verses, but it leads us to the conclusion of what happens to a person who says, I'm going to contend with God, fight God, I'm going to do my own thing. Their end is going to come eventually. Look at this. Jesus is speaking here too, verse 13. Then the king said to the attendants, this is a new group of people, the attendants, bind him, the guy that was dressed inappropriately, hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. There's no way that the listeners are like, wait, what just happened? The consequences to our actions in this life. There's some consequences that will only be short-lived in this life, but what you do with Jesus will affect you for forever with no end. This 
if you've never read these verses before or seen these verses before, this may blow your picture of who Jesus is because maybe you were just given that, you know, Sunday school picture of Jesus and the children, the sheep and all that other stuff. And you don't realize that Jesus talks more about hell than he talks about heaven. And why does he? Because he wants no one to go there. Hell. He wants everyone to go to heaven. And so he warns people because he actually cares about them. You know, if you ever run across somebody that says, no, hell's just made up and it's figurative and all that other stuff, and if they say they're a Christian, I just have to tell you, they're not following the Jesus of the Bible. Because Jesus believes that there's a hell. Jesus talks about it. I understand how it's super convenient to make up that hell doesn't exist, which would then justify living however you want, but it's just not true. Jesus, the one who lived, died, and defeated death and rose again, talks about this place. This outer darkness, this um, place of sorrows, it's in such contrast to the wedding feast. The wedding feast is light and it's joy, and it's God just showering his love upon all those who have received him. So no one in heaven would have been forced to be in heaven. I'm dragging you to heaven, says God. No, he says that to no one. Everyone that's there is of their own choice. They've desired to be there. And everyone who's not there has of their desire and choice chosen not to be there. For eternity, everyone will be exactly where they want it to be. That is a chilling thought. No way, Jim. Are you saying that some people wanted to be except? Yeah, some people want nothing to do with God. And if you want nothing to do with God, that means everything that is good and right and peaceable and joyful is gone forever. There's only darkness. And it's a place of regret and sorrow. It's a place you would never wish on your greatest enemy. A place where just, the vis- just that picture there, where all you hear, you don't see anything, you just hear weeping, regretful, sorrowful weeping, and the grinding of teeth. And I don't think the English language does any justice to what it actually is. I think it's so horrifying of a place. Jim, I don't understand. Why would God make a place like that? It was never made for people. It was made for the angels who with Lucifer, rebelled against God because they saw who God was. They saw God in all his glory and they chose with free will to rebel against him. And so God has a place for them. But what about the person that doesn't want anything to do with God? Well, the place for them to be is the place where he isn't. God doesn't desire anybody to go there. And so that's why at the end of a person's life, God would just go, I gave you this invitation and 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 this. And And the thing is, the listener will go, I know, I know. I'm thankful that we teach through the Bible because can you see how if we didn't teach through the Bible, how it's really easy to go, you know what, let's just skip the first 14 verses of Matthew 22. And I believe that's why in some churches you don't hear about hell because hell is not a topic that is like, yay, what did you talk about this morning? Hell. Actually, we didn't talk about hell. We talked about a wedding feast. And then we talked about an alternate to it, which is no good. If you've never heard this, I I just want you to know it's right there in the word. And I didn't say these words. Jesus said these words. I'm going to show you one last verse here. Luke 13, 23 and 24. Again, this is Jesus. And somebody said to Jesus, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And Jesus said, he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and not be able to, or not, and will not be able. And you go, wait, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, if you want to go through the narrow door, how are you not able to go? That seems unfair. Like, is God like stopping people who want to? What this is saying is that the idea of heaven is a great idea. And there's a lot of people that are like, I want to go to heaven. Okay, but that door is narrow. How narrow? It's in the shape of a cross. You have to go through one person to get there. Jesus. Muhammad? Buddha? 
Joseph Smith? Nope. My good works? My high intellect? Nope. That stuff is all sticking out and you're going to get jammed up in the doorway and you can't get through. You have to let go of all those things that you think make you righteous because they don't. And you have to enter through the door that is Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so that's why Jesus says, there's going to be plenty of people that go, I'd love to go to heaven, but they're actually not willing to go through Jesus. I'm thankful that God didn't give us 4,000 doors to try to figure out which the right one is. God said, listen, I don't want you to waste your short life. I want you to be fulfilled and have joy. And so I'm going to make it real easy. There's only one door and his name is Jesus. And what do people do? Yeah, I don't want to do it that way. There is no other way. God has given me the power and the authority to say this. You're invited to come to his wedding and he wants you to come. Christian, God has also given you the power and authority to tell that to other people. God is inviting everyone and anyone to come. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up here on stage. And it would be wrong for me at the end of this message if I did not invite you to become a Christian. God longs for you to be at that wedding feast. But you have to choose him yourself. It doesn't matter if you're raised in the church. It doesn't matter if your grandma brought you to church. It doesn't matter if you own 10 Bibles. What matters is if you've received Jesus as your king and as your savior. And that's a very personal decision. But this, mor but, but this morning, God has given you another invitation. So let's bow our head and close our eyes. And <clears throat> if you'd like to receive Jesus in your heart, you can pray a prayer like this to him. Remember, it's not the words, it's your heart towards God. God, I recognize my need for a Savior. I realize that I can't be right with you in my works. God, I believe that the only way to you is through Jesus. And Jesus, I ask you, invite you to come into my heart and to come into my life. I'm messed up and I can't change myself. God, please change my heart. I've done many things wrong. God, I ask you to forgive me for the things I've done against others and against you. My thoughts, my words, my actions. Jesus, I believe you came here to die for me and to pay the price for me so that I could receive it freely. Jesus, thank you for all you've done. Help me to walk in the right direction and help me to be a light and a hope to people around me. Thank you for saving a spot for me at the wedding feast. I can't wait to see you face to face. We've got our heads bowed. We've got our eyes closed still. If you're here this morning and you prayed that prayer, I will not embarrass you. But would you just raise your hand so that I could just uh, acknowledge that? Is there anybody here this morning that received Jesus as their Lord and Savior? I see your hand, ma'am. Is there anyone else? I see your hand, sir. Is there anyone else? Okay, I see your hand. God bless you. Is there anyone else? You can put your hands down. Papa, thank you so much for these dear people. You've loved them their whole life. I thank you, God, that you've prepared a place for them. And between now and then, Lord, you just want them to reflect your love to the people right around them. I pray for the struggles that they would go through and the challenges that they have. God, you're able to meet them and you're able to give them the strength day by day. Oh God, pour your love and power on them. We pray these things. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, I don't... Um, I think it's important that you talk about heaven and I think it's important that you talk about hell. Because if you don't, then you're not talking about what's real. And you, um, you can leave people in a place where they have this illusion of how things actually are and they haven't been told the truth. So 
as you give people the invitation and as you tell people about how good Jesus is, make sure you tell them the truth. Do not water it down and do not modify it. It's not your message to change or mess with. It's God's message. And the world needs to hear it. So God bless you. Listen, if you need some prayer, if you gave your life to Jesus, make sure you tell somebody before you leave. If you need prayer about anything, a few of us will be right up here. If you're able to, can you stand? We're going to sing a closing song to our Lord. God bless you.
great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Lord Heavenly Father, you are so great. Thank you so much for cloaking us with righteousness that we can't achieve on our own merits. Thank you for reminding us and showing us how broken we are. It's only when we can accept that, acknowledge that, that we can humble ourselves uh, at your feet, Lord, just to accept this free gift that you give to us. Such a wonderful gift that it is. Just pray that you keep working in our hearts, transforming us, uh, helping us be more like you, walking in the direction that you would have for us. Help us be a light to those in this world, uh, those around us. We love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week.